Welcome back to the engineer's kitchen. If you remember last time, we had a quick look at the candy floss machine. We saw how its spinning disc and melted sugar was spun into very, very thin glassy threads. We also saw that most of the candy floss was actually air, but we did end up with quite some waste. We saw how much candy floss we would need to fill this tub, but three quarters of the sugar that we used actually had to be recycled. Question is, can we make that process more efficient? Candy floss only has one ingredient, the sugar. But there are many different types of sugar. Some you'll be familiar with, some you won't. So let's look at the different types of sugar and see whether they make different types of candy floss for a start. This is granulated sugar. You know this sugar, it's the sort of sugar you put in your tea. Next is caster sugar. Caster sugar is finely ground granulated sugar. It's the kind of sugar that you find coating your donuts. It actually, because it's smaller, it dissolves more quickly. Then we have icing sugar. Now icing sugar is super fine ground sugar. And also, to stop it clumping together, you often find that it's had corn flour added into it as well. Because icing sugar is so fine, it dissolves very quickly, which is why we often use it in things that aren't going to be heated. Then we have the biggest crystal of sugar that we're going to use today, and that's sanding sugar. Very often comes rainbow coloured, and it's used in our food and cakes to give them texture and crunch. It's also the one that is the most resistant to heat because the crystals are so big. All of these are white refined sugars. Yes, even the pink one. What they do when they refine it is they take out the molasses, which is a sticky, black, treacly stuff. As engineers don't like waste, this stuff is often used for cattle feed or as an ingredient in the food industry for things like barbecue sauce. Sometimes we make sugar and we leave the molasses in. And this is our last sugar. It's called dark muscovado sugar. It has all of those molasses left in it. So these are our different sugars. Let's have a think about how our experiment is going to be formed. Well, the first question that we need to ask is what do we mean by more efficient? Which is the more efficient sugar? It doesn't really make sense. So let's break that down. Do we mean the sugar that produces the less waste when we have candy floss? Or do we mean the one that is the quickest to make? Thinking it through, if we make candy floss really quickly, then we use less energy. So we're looking at the fastest candy floss and we're also looking at the one that uses up the most sugar in going into the candy floss and giving us the least amount of waste. So now what we have to do is form a hypothesis. Of our sugars, which one do we think is going to be the one that is the fastest floss? Which one is going to be the one that is the most productive or yields the most candy floss? And why might that be? Might the fastest one be the one that has the finest grain? Might the one that produces the least amount of waste be the one that melts the slowest? There's only one way to find out. Let's decide on our method. What about our experimental conditions? Candy floss doesn't react well to humidity, moisture in the air. So what we're going to do is make all of our candy floss on the same day. We're going to use the same amount of sugar each time we make it. And we're also going to preheat our machine so that it is exactly the same temperature for each one. We're also going to clean the machine out between each batch of candy floss, just to make sure that nothing sneaks through from the last batch. Let's get on with making our first batch. Let's start with granulated sugar. While we're waiting for this first batch, here's an explanation of why sugar crystals melt. By heating the sugar gently, the sucrose molecules split into their smaller and sweeter glucose and fructose molecules. The leftover atoms from the sucrose molecule are some clumps of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. The last two forming a small amount of water, which is why we get a syrup. Providing that we don't heat it too much and the water doesn't evaporate, we can make spun sugar. If the water evaporates, the sugars become oxidised, the carbon clumps start to burn and we get caramelisation. We will look more closely at the chemistry of sugar in our food in the next episode. And that's our lot for the first batch. Well, I must say, I'm quite impressed. However, what we're going to do now is weigh it. Now, notice I'm only weighing just the candy floss. And that, I'm going to make a measurement of. 
I'm going to clean this up and we'll get ready for the next batch. This time we're going to use caster sugar. Mmm. Now let's get ready for our next sugar. This time caster sugar. It's more finely ground than the granulated sugar, so it should dissolve a little bit more quickly. So let's get this warmed up, but ask yourself, do you think that this is going to be the faster one? Well, let's see. Meanwhile, well, let's have a little bit of a history lesson. Over to you, John. Spun sugar dates back to at least the 15th century, when creative Italian cooks melted the sugar, drew it out with a fork and draped the thin strands over a broom handle. In the 16th century, Henry III of France, on a state visit to Venice, was treated to an all-sugar banquet, complete with spun sugar cutlery and tablecloth. And in the early 19th century, French celebrity chef Marie-Antoine Carême, who made Napoleon's wedding cake, was famed for his spun sugar windmills, fountains, gondolas and temples. Sometimes, simple engineering ideas go on to become hugely successful businesses. Batch number two. Doesn't look to be as much this time, does there? But to be sure, we're going to weigh it. Not bad. This time we have 3.08 grams. And it also took three minutes and four this time. Let me get ready for the next one. The next one is icing sugar. So this is the finest of our sugars. So what do we think will happen? Have a guess. In the meantime, here is a language lesson. The inventors of the candy floss machine, John C. Wharton, and ironically, a dentist, William Morrison, called it fairy floss. It first became known as cotton candy when the machine was improved in the 1920s, perversely by another dentist named Josef Laskow. Since then, it has traveled the world under different names. Here in the UK, it's candy floss, but it's still fairy floss in Australia. The French call it la berbe papa, or papa's beard while our Italian cousins call it zucchero filato, or sugar thread. Yes, engineering has a long and global history. I've got to clean this afterwards. Oh dear. So the first thing that I noticed was that there were great clouds of icing sugar everywhere. And my candy floss doesn't really inspire me to think, hmm, nice, candy floss. What I've, what I've got is something that resembles the kind of thing that you get on the end of a cotton bud. Still, let's weigh it all the same. We have our time. It's very quick. I don't think icing sugar is the best sugar we could use. I'll make a note of this and then we'll get ready to do the next one. Now the next one, strangely enough, is pink. The first three sugars we used were all white, so I made white candy floss. I tried to buy plain sanding sugar, but it wasn't easy to find. However, supermarkets tend to sell this glimmer sugar, which often has rainbow colours added. Maybe it's because pink foods are delicious. Think about strawberries and rhubarb. We don't see many natural blue foods, so engineers don't usually design many food products that look blue. As this video is launched on December the 7th, National Cotton Candy Day in the USA, what food colours do you think would be popular as we approach the holiday season? Hmm. Again, not terribly impressive, is it? What's the first thing you notice about it, though? It still went quickly. It was still less than two and a half minutes. But is it candy floss? What's interesting is that actually all of the waste sugar looks like a ring of pink around the inside of our candy floss machine. I think I might keep that back for myself later. Let's weigh it and see how we've done. Barely pathetic. Let me just clean this up. I'll make a note of these. And then we'll get onto our last one, which is the Muscovado sugar. This one interests me the most. The first three were pure sugar. The sanding sugar contained a glazing agent, shellac, a wax secreted on tree branches by the Caryolaca insect, as it makes a hard waterproof cocoon. It's a safe and natural product to add in, but vegans probably wouldn't eat glimmer sugar. 
It didn't change the flavour of the candy floss, but the Moscovado sugar contains all the natural molasses that the others of all had refined out of them. Is that sticky content going to change the flavour? Is it even going to work? We seem to be learning a lot about the kind of sugars that we do and we don't want to use the candy floss. What's interesting in this one is actually that there is an awful lot of melted brown sugar around the inside. You might have noticed that when I put it in, it all stuck together in clumps. And because of that, some of it is over there where the cat lives. Some of it is, well, in my hair. As regards candy floss, doesn't look very good. Let's weigh it. Doesn't even make the scales move. So let me write this down. We'll clean up and we'll have a think about our conclusions. What have we learned? I personally wouldn't call any of the last three candy floss. For me, candy floss was the first two. So while they might have been quick, very quick in some cases, it wasn't really very good. And there was a lot of waste in each of them. So between the first two, granulated sugar and caster sugar both took about three minutes. But the granulated sugar made five and a quarter grams of candy floss, whereas the caster sugar only made three. Maybe that's because these machines are designed by engineers to be the just perfect temperature to melt granulated sugar and to spin their syrup to make the best candy floss. You might think that this is all about food. No. Engineers are using candy floss making principles to be able to spin thin webs of other materials that they can then use to grow cells on. If they can grow cells, then we can grow organs. If we can grow organs, then we don't need to grow them in complex gels and things like that. So we're not only looking at the history of the past, but we're also looking at the future. And that's starting to see the world like an engineer. Next time, we're going to look at the chemistry of sugar in a little bit more detail, even the chemistry that makes up sugar. We're also going to look at some other substitutes and things that aren't even sugar. So thank you very much for watching. My name's been John Wood. <laughs>